The Lord be with you. And also with you. I don't really have any announcement any announcements except Happy Father's Day. <laughs> and apparently I have the hiccups. You know. <laughs> We'll find a way to get through that. Johnny, is that uh, Father's Day liturgy on, on there next? Yeah. Okay. And as you're able, do you ever have a bulletin? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get people to use them up. We make them and nobody picks them up. As you're able, would you stand? On the back of your bulletin and on the screen. Well, I have the wrong one. <laughs> Blessed are you, Lord, our God, Creator and Redeemer of all, of all. You father us from all eternity, giving life to crea creation and pouring your love into all you've made. From the beginning, we've known you as Father, and all our families have their origin in you. Through the love of earthly fathers, you give us a glimpse of your everlasting love. We give thanks for our heavenly Father. We give thanks for those fathers who strive to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children with an honest awareness of both joy and sacrifice. We give thanks for joy and sacrifice of our fathers. And we pray for those fathers who, lacking a good model for a father, have worked to become good fathers. We give thanks for those fathers who work for the Lord. We thank you for those fathers who, by their own account, were not always there for their children but who continue to offer these children now grown their love and support. We give thanks for fathers who work too hard. We also give thanks for those fathers who, despite divorce, have remained in their children's lives, and for those fathers whose children are adopted and whose love and support is offered healing. We give thanks for fathers who love and build. We thank you for those fathers who, as stepfathers, freely chose the obligation of fatherhood and earned their stepchildren's love and respect. We give thanks to those who volunteer to do our Father's work. And we ask your special blessing on those fathers who have lost a child to death and who continue to hold those children in their hearts. We give thanks for those fathers who say you can be free to free. We also give thanks for those men who have no children but cherish the next generation as if it were their own. We give thanks for those men who care about the children. We pray for those men who have fathered us in their role as mentors and guides. We give thanks for the men who come to show us the way. We ask your blessing on those men who are about to become fathers. May they openly delight in their children. We give thanks for soon to be fathers. And we continue to pray for those fathers who have died, but live in our memories and whose love continues to nurture us. We give thanks for the memories of our fathers. May the love of our earthly fathers draw us near to you. And perfect us in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the church said. Amen. As you remain standing, let's sing together. Uh, this is my Father's world. It's number 144. <laughs> this is my Father's world. sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of the rocks and trees of skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrong. This is my Father's world. As 
as you will remain, please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning comes. Uh, <laughs> well, I've got too many pieces of paper here. It comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's in the eighth chapter, verses twenty-six through thirty-nine. Then they arrived in the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite to Galilee. As he stepped out of the land, a man of the city who had had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there were on the hillside a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man whom the demons had gone out of sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told him how the one who had been possessed by the demons had now been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home, and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, claiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's affirm our faith this morning with the traditional Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. sing together first and as well with my soul. If during that time you would feel inclined to come and play, pray up here at the rails, you're certainly welcome to do so. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea
shall be signed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. I've got some campers that are sitting out there, and I've got one camper that's sitting up here. Would y'all all come up to the front? Yay. Just line yourselves up right here in the front where everybody can get So this coming week, these people are our missionaries. We're sending them to Lakeview, where they can teach people about and learn about Jesus. You know, we, we send these adults, and we think, well, they're going to go teach everybody. They learn stuff too. And they'll get to see God's grace in action. Isn't that right? Sometimes the cabinet counselors see it more than anybody else. <laughs> so I want us to pray for them as they go on this journey. They're, they're representing us, and I'm proud to have them do it. We'll, uh, we have three campers, two adults going, and one, one camper that's as big as an adult. And uh, some of y'all know most of these people. You don't know Dawson, maybe. It's Dawson, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you, this is Dawson. He's going to be a. Uh, he's going to be representing us as well. So uh, if you, you we don't need to come up here and do it, but let's pray for them. If you want to put your hand up as we aim these prayers at them, let's join together in prayer. Gracious God, we we pray for safe travels on Monday as these kids go and adults go up to camp. We pray that they'll not only meet you there, but that they'll take you with them as they go there. And they will have fun, and they will have community, and they will do all of that in the name of Jesus Christ. And then we ask for safe travels as they return back, and we look forward next week to hearing a report of how camp went. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Y'all can sit. <laughs> Friends, let's pray. Gracious God, not only do we pray for these campers, but we pray for each of us as we go out from this place and we celebrate Father's Day, we celebrate summer, and for the most part, we stay out of the heat. But God, we know that you have given us this task for a purpose. It is our call and our task to make disciples for Jesus Christ and to transform the world. So sometimes as we read the scriptures, some of the prophets felt discouraged and sometimes we're discouraged. Seems like the world just isn't changing fast enough. But God, we know that it's all in your time. So today we gather and we pray for each other in our community, those that are grieving the loss of a loved one, those that are dealing with illness and sickness, and those that are awaiting changes from medical reports that they get from their doctor. Today we praise you for what we have. Thank God for what you will give us. And we look forward with the hope that springs eternal to the days ahead. Jesus walked and talked on this planet. And he showed us what love really looked like. And as we get closer to him, we know that we're closer to you. But even the disciples at times wondered what to do. And they one time looked at Jesus and said, what do we do when we pray? And he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear from Isaiah this morning, let's uh, sing Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. This is one of Charles Wesley's hymns. Uh, just pay particular attention to the last verse. Always in the last verse of a Charles Wesley hymn, everybody gets to go to heaven. So that's a good thing. We look forward to that. Love divine, all love's excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling. All thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou sought out by those who did not ask to be found by those who did not seek me I said here I am here I am to a nation that did not call on my name I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good following their own devices people who provoke me to my face continually sacrificing in gardens offering incense on bricks who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I'm too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions, thus says the Lord. As the wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there's a blessing in it. I will do for my servants' sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. 
So I entitled this message today, Those Who Praise the Lord. The prophet Isaiah is uh, living in a difficult time. The people from Judah don't like the people from Israel. They're not communicating with each other. People are out doing whatever they want willy-nilly. They're not paying any attention to God's call on their life. They've created silos where my way is the right way and we worship ever how we want, whenever we want, whoever we want. It's a very different time now, isn't it? Or is it? Maybe people are doing the same thing that they've always done. is separating themselves into groups. Deciding their group is better than the other group. Failing to communicate back and forth. Yesterday I went to a place here in Pasadena to buy a park for my boat. I've been waiting to buy it for a long time. I was pretty excited to go and buy a park for my boat. All I wanted to do was go in there and show them what I had. It was a fuel line and get another one. And for 20 minutes, I got a political discussion that I didn't want and I didn't pay for it. All I wanted was a part. Now, it might be enough to keep me from going back. Customer service evidently was not that guy's forte. But I wonder how many times we've been guilty maybe of the same thing. As we find ourselves in a group where we get together and we talk about whatever that's going on in the world and we forget about the important things that are going on in the world as far as I can tell all of us got up this morning breathing with our heart beating as far as I can tell we all have so much to be blessed about and so thankful for and yet so many times we don't spend any time in that thankfulness we spend time in trying to tell people if they just do it my way life would be better it's not just the world it happens in the church too Years ago in Arkansas, there was a church that was called the Church of the Left Foot. Yeah, that's an interesting name for a church, isn't it? Well, they were a foot washing church. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a foot washing ceremony. They're impressive. But they did it every week. And by the name of the church, you might guess they started with the left foot. One year they got a new preacher. That preacher liked to start with the right foot. It caused the church to split. In that community now, there are two churches. There's the church of the left foot and the church of the right foot. That seems just a bit absurd, doesn't it? I mean, really, does it matter which foot? We don't know which foot Jesus washed first. We can't even lean back on the scripture to say he started with Peter's left foot. We don't know. But somehow they've become so entrenched in the way they did things that they thought that was the only way you could do it. In Orange, as you go on Interstate 10, going toward Louisiana, there's a, the first Second Baptist Church. <laughs> I don't get it. The first Second Baptist, or the second first, or whatever they want to name it. Can't we just be the church? And all around the community now, you'll see signs where we, we have to have this kind of church, or that kind of, this one's contemporary, this one's traditional. And, and then we get into the notion that only traditional churches are good and only contemporary churches are good and, and, and only churches that baptize the way we baptize and only churches that have the same theology that I have. You know, God didn't come for a person. He came for all persons. God didn't come for one denomination. God came for the people. And in Wesley's work in England way years ago, he realized that, that the church had become this place that was more like a country club where the rich folk went and the people that were working in the mines, the laborers, if you wanted to put that down into Pasadena language, those that worked for the refineries that were working shift work and stuff, they weren't as important. Maybe they didn't have a, a white collar job. Maybe they didn't have a law degree. Maybe they didn't even go to college. And we find ways to separate ourselves and yet God says that all people have value. All people. Our district superintendent made a statement one day in one of the multitudes of meetings that I'm required to go to. And he said, I can't believe in a God that would set anybody aside. 
anybody. And we would all kind of agree God doesn't set people aside, but we sure do. And I'm no better than anybody else. I look out at sometimes and, and I get irritated with, 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 I drove around my driveway this morning out into the street and one of my neighbors had a party and there's evidence of it all over my front yard. My sweet wife said, we ought to put a sign up that says, if you have a party, clean up your own trash. I mean, don't we feel that way sometimes? If you just do your thing and do it, leave me alone. Isn't that what this scripture says the people are doing? They're telling God, leave us alone. We're just going to do what we do when we do it the way we do it. And God's tempted in this scripture just to wipe them out. But he realizes that even in the grapes, there's some good ones. And even in the culture and the society and the world we live in today, there are some good folk out there that deserve to know that Jesus loves them and cares about them. I don't know about you, but we get to Father's Day, I think back about my dad. I guess we all do in a way. I was asking people in Sunday school what the best memory they had of their dad. I, I have so many of things that my dad did for me. Not because I ask often, but because he felt like it was his job to do as my dad. I remember one time when I was moving, and of course I was working, and I was a single dad, and I was trying to, to move from one address to the other, and, and packing all the stuff that we accumulate up is, uh, is a job. And, and uh, I would go off to work, and Pop was sitting there doing stuff, and at the end of the day, he was worn out. And he said, I just wish I could do more. Now we pray that every father has that attitude, but I know they didn't. Some of them were too busy. Some of them couldn't get there. The older I get, the more that song, The Cats in the Cradle, rings true for me. When I think about the times I didn't have time for my kids. When I think about the times I didn't live up to what they needed in a dad. And I did the best I could. And I'm sure my dad did the best he could. And probably yours did too. But sometimes that best wasn't what we really needed. It takes a lot. To be a father. And it takes a lot for us to understand the fatherhood of God. What God means when, when God says, I'm your father, I love you, I care about you. When God cares enough to send his only son to give his life for us. Even though we have let him down time and time and time again. A friend of mine this morning posted on Facebook, he's a preacher up in the other part of Houston. He said, folks, just in case you didn't know it, the church is not closed. You know what that tells me is my friend Stefan is dealing with the same thing we are. Lots of empty seats. I talked to my friends over in LaPorte, in Clear Lake. Everybody's attendance is down. And it makes you wonder, one of two things, either they just got out of the habit, or maybe it didn't mean that much to them anyway. I don't know. I'm reading a book right now that's called Next After Normal. I don't know where we go from here, but I know God's calling and leading us to be something different. Instead of being people that stand behind a fence somewhere and say, come over and check me out, we're willing to tear the fence down and see what it's like on the other side. To listen and pay attention and care about people. And I'm not telling you you have to agree with them or even like it. But what if we just did what my third grade school teacher said and we used our ears twice as often as we use our mouth? Uh, we have two of them, only one mouth. What if we just listened? What if we gave others the courtesy of caring about their perspective? And I'm not just talking about the political world we live in, and I'm not just talking about the economy. I'm talking about the stuff that way is more important than that. I'm talking about eternal life and eternity. And the leadership that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gives us. When He, he goes in, in this scripture we had in Luke, He goes to a place nobody wanted to go to hang out with somebody nobody wanted to be with. And he doesn't even encourage him to follow him and go with him. He says, go into the place where you came from and tell people what difference it made for me to be in your life. 
Now, if you've been coming here long, you've heard me say that a couple of times. What difference does God make in your life? And I guess it would be fair to say that if you're here, He's made some difference. Now, a lot of people say, well, preacher, you know, you, you, <laughs> I get so irritated at you guys, all of you, you know, we go somewhere and you want me to pray. You pray. I'm going to start telling people I'm the janitor. We all need to be praying. We all need to be, we don't have to do it eloquently or with fine words, but we can all pray. Every time we go out to eat as a group, we pray. It doesn't have to be a long pray. In fact, what you want is the guy with the hottest food to be the one to pray because that's going to be the shortest prayer. The length of the prayer isn't important. What you say isn't important. It's where your heart is. And let me tell you the scary part. This is what I found out after doing this for a few years. Is the harder I pray for others to change, the more it changes me. The harder I pray for the world to be like I want it to be, the more God moves me to be like He wants me to be. I've had my struggles. Just continue to have them. I still believe in miracles. How about you? I still believe that God can change things that we don't think are changeable. Some years ago, we were having a discussion it came close to an argument at annual conference. And everybody was saying, well, we've got to make this decision today because that might happen later. And we've got to do this now because that might happen later. And Todd Jordan stood up and he said, you know, you remember we just went through Pentecost. He said, on day 49, before Pentecost, which is the 50th day after Easter, on day 49, nobody spoke the same language. Nobody got along. Nobody paid any attention to either of each other. And they had pretty much given up. And then suddenly God moved. According to the Scriptures, there's a sound that people heard, a resounding sound. One of the versions calls it a cacophony of sound. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? And everybody there heard God's Word in their own language. On day 49, there was no hope. On day 50, everybody gets the message. That's God's timing, not ours. And we keep thinking there's no hope. Well, there is always hope. The scripture I used last week, remember what it said if you were here. It says that suffering brings about character and character brings about strength and strength about brings about endurance and endurance brings about hope. So people, this is not time for us to give up. It's not time for us to be sad. It's time for us to be joyful and hopeful about the future. Now, I know that's hard when you pull your car up to the gas station and pay $100 for a tank of gas. Especially when, when <laughs> your paycheck wasn't $100. I get that. And I know we live in troubled times, but you don't think these guys living in this time had troubled times too? And they got through it, and we ought to use that. It ought to give us confidence that the tough times then have created strength and endurance to bring the faith to a place where we get exposed to it today. I think back about those people that started this church back in 1937. I can't really imagine what Golden Acres looked like in 1937, and really, probably none of you can either. It was a very different place. When they built the community, there were two churches, one on Lily Street and one on Pansy. I'm glad we get to be the Lilies. Thank you for the laugh, wherever that came from. <laughs> and the community needed a church, and the land developer knew that. i got to tell you, friends, look at these new communities that are being built. Do you see land set aside for a church? Are people paying attention to think that we ought to make the church the center of our community? That's how churches ended up with neighborhood names. The church where, where I was baptized was called Foster Place Methodist Church because it was in Foster Place. This was called Golden Acres United Methodist Church because it was in Golden Acres. Sunset. Nobody would name a church Sunset. It would be Sunrise. But it was in the Sunset Subdivision. That's what we did. We put churches in communities because we knew that community needed to provide community for the people. The church was given tax-free status so we could become a, a force in the, in the community for people to get something and not be a burden on the community. So the church has a purpose. 
And, and I think the hardest thing for us right now is to figure out what our purpose is. Is our purpose just to be a place to come and sit in air conditioning, which is working really well? I am so grateful for those that made donations to help us pay the bill. If anybody else is inclined, we're still accepting them. But uh, I, I am so grateful to have a cool place to come and, and a place where we can be comfortable and sit here. But, you know, I also think about those people that don't have that. I think about churches where people are afraid, uh, where they're afraid to be seen going into a church. I think of places where the communities have changed around the church, and what they've done is built big fences to keep people out so that nobody that lives around the community can come to that church. I don't know what it is that makes us so afraid of the people God created. Now, I know there's good cause to lock your doors and things like that because there's everybody out there hadn't listened to one of these wonderful sermons. Everybody out there isn't caring about everybody else. And I'm not suggesting that we go out and find the people that we find despicable and, and go home with them or take them to our house. But I am suggesting that they need to hear that God made a difference in your life and God can make a difference in theirs. What this scripture reminds us is that God is there for even people that don't listen to Him. God is there for even people that don't pay attention to Him. And it's in God's infinite wisdom that God can select even the good ones out of the bad grapes. And God has sent Jesus for us with the specific understanding in the Gospel of John that the better we know Jesus, the better we know God, and the better God knows us. To be known by God is an incredible thing. How many of us have heard, we hope our name is in the book of life? How many of us have hoped that when that day comes that we go to meet Jesus, that we're in good standing with Him? But it's always been a struggle. Even the Emperor Constantine worried about it. He said, if I profess my faith in Jesus too soon and then I, I sin afterward, I might lose it. We deal with these this this kind of oppositional thinking about, well, there's this evil force out there and it's equal to God. It is not equal to God. Ransom for Jesus wasn't paid to the devil. God always has been omnipotent. God has always been the creator. God has always been the one that created all of this for the people and the people were created to serve Him. I wish I had a solution. We could all go home and do this, that, and that, and everything would be better tomorrow. But if we're really people of hope, if we really believe that Jesus is the King of Kings, if we really believe that miracles happen and that somehow this transformation of the world is possible to happen, then shouldn't we be going about that business? Shouldn't we be going about the business of changing lives? of offering grace and mercy and love even when it feels weird. Even when it feels like a burden. I love these old hymns. <laughs> Since I had to leave the singing today, I picked some I knew. Probably you knew most of these today because we all grew up in the same world, right? Love divine, all love's excelling. Do you realize that if you just listened to the words of the 6,000 hymns that Charles Wesley wrote, you would have a wonderful theological education. Sometimes we get in discussions about whether to sing all the verses or not. The hymns tell a story. I was kidding earlier, you know, the, the worst thing in the world, according to my Baptist preacher friends, would be to be the third verse of a Baptist hymn. Because it never gets sung. <laughs> and that's a quote from a Baptist preacher I didn't make that up <laughs> but I, I think sometimes we, we, we have become so entrenched in the rituals of the way we've always done it that when we do something new or we see the opportunity for something new we resist it that's what this, this prophet is talking about here when he says doing the stuff you've always done because you've always done it doesn't make you holy what makes you holy is doing the stuff that God wants you to do. And he clearly says, burning incense on a, my version says a brick, that's not going to get you to heaven. But if burning incense on a brick makes you feel closer to God, it would be a useful thing to do. 
And sometimes the rituals that we have, they don't seem to have any meaning. They don't seem to be important to people. Even the naming of churches nowadays seems odd. People seem afraid to admit that they're a United Methodist Church. It's been my heritage. I'm proud of it. I'm not ashamed to be United Methodist. Now, is the United Methodist Church perfect? No. Nope. We got our issues. Because we're filled with human beings, and human beings have issues. We're, uh, when one of these guys go to camp, I, I was the camp coordinator for a number of years. At the time we were doing it, we had a smaller number, about 800 in camp. And it was an actual representation of the world we live in. <laughs> we had problems, things came up, people didn't do by go the rules, people got in trouble, people got disciplined. It was the regular world happening at camp. The first day of camp, a bunch of kids show up, a bunch of campers show up, they don't know each other. And then because of the way it's set up, by the end of the week, they have community and they have best friends and they have relationships that last eternally. It's the largest training event we do in our conference. Sometime before the summer's over, we will have sent nearly 4,000 people to camp at Lakeview. And I wasn't kidding a while ago when I said the adults get trained too. They get to meet Jesus in ways they never thought they would. They have little kids. I, I remember one year we had a young lady there that uh, had been a foster child and she was taken in by a family. And the family sent her to camp. She was oppositional, maybe with good cause. She was a problem. She ran away a lot. She had to be followed and watched and held and taken care of. And frankly, nobody wanted to be around her very much. And then on Friday, when they got ready to have their last worship service, they had a foot washing. And that little girl's life was changed because somebody took the time to take a towel and some water and reach over and love her and care for her and wash her feet. If you're only washing feet because the left foot is the right foot, or the right foot is the left foot, you're probably missing the point. But to get on your knees and wash the feet of a stranger, even when they've been a little hellion all week long, can be a life-changing event in that other person's life. When Roy James was our district superintendent, most of you don't know that Roy was from Fort Arthur. Years and years ago, Janice Joplin went to Lakeview. They found her so difficult to control that they sent her home. Nobody knows what would have happened had they not, but what if they'd have worked with her and held her hand and chased her around and done all the stuff we did with that other young lady? And maybe on Friday when they had their closing service, she would have found out what it's like to be really loved and cared about. Maybe it could have changed her life. It's always been my prayer not to send kids home from camp. Sometimes we had to have some counseling sessions. Sometimes we had to talk to them. In fact, during my time as coordinator, I sent him way more counselors than I did kids. Yeah, we, we believe in safety for our children and treating them a certain way. And we believe that that's how we demonstrate God's love. Isn't that what we believe here too? That in spite of somebody's inerrant behavior or, or a crazy past, that there is hope that God's kingdom can be fulfilled by showing them the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. I guess I'm a little bit oppositional too. My, one of my main things Dad taught me was a camp never did anything. So when they sent me to a little church on the corner of Lily and Holly and said, you can't do much with it. In fact, when I thanked Bishop Huey for sending me a mother church, I was sort of joking. It was sort of a tongue and choke, a cheap statement. She said, well, we may have sent you a stepmother. Because it wasn't really flourishing when I got here. A lot of people said, there's no hope. That church can't grow. And the first year we were open, we had 35 adults profess faith in Jesus Christ. We have a lot more resources today. 
We have a lot more critical mass today. We have a lot more people today. We have a lot more to do today. And I haven't given up hope, friends. Nobody's going to tell me we can't make it. Nobody's going to tell me we can't offer Christ to a community and that we are in a place where nobody cares about because I believe there are people around us that care. And I believe there are people around us that would love to be a part of a community like this one. And you know, if they didn't like this one, if they grew up in a different tradition in a different way, maybe it was our task to not get them here, but to get them somewhere. I mean, there's an Assembly of God church up on Spencer, just a few blocks, away, not even really a block away. There's a Baptist church a couple of blocks that way. There's a Catholic church down the street. We can, we've can we got a wide open cafeteria to offer people a way to Christ, and I believe they can find Christ in any of those. I don't think it's a time for sadness and fear. I think it's a time to praise the Lord. For all of us, who are seeking God. For us, praise, it says here, those who seek, praise the Lord. Are we seekers? Are we seeking the kingdom of God? Are we seeking the ability to kneel with praise and joy when we finally make that trip and get to meet the Father face to face? Are we living in fear of what will happen if we don't? We have a choice. The choice is ours. Years ago, I taught confirmation told this in Sunday school earlier. There were 13 or 14 kids in the confirmation class. I came out of a sales background. And my sales background, if you know, the task is to get people to do what you want them to do. And before that, I was a policeman. Well, our, <laughs> your task when you're a cop is to get people to do what you want them to do. And out of this, kids, two or three of them said, we don't want to be baptized. We don't want to be confirmed. We're not ready to make that commitment. I went to the pastor and I said, man, I, I'm a failure. He said, you're not a failure. He said, if there's no opportunity to say no, then what does yes mean? And there are people out there that are saying no in our community and in the world. And there are people out there that are saying, we don't pray in public. And there are people out there saying, we can't do this because we're Christian. Well, I got news for you, friends. We can pray no matter what they tell us. We can stand up for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no matter what they say. I'm willing to go there if you are. To make a difference in this community, in this town, in this county, this state, in this nation, and in the world. I think that's our calling. The words of John Wesley said, the world is my parish. Well, the world's coming to our doorstep, friends. It's all around just because somebody has a different culture or they don't have the same background in faith doesn't mean they're not people we can reach. I think really the accurate word there is people that God can reach. And He just might use us. I think I can't think of a better thing to think about on Father's Day is the difference the men have made in my life, my dad, uncles, and others. We have absolute proof that when these churches that send buses out to get kids to church, it, it, it gets the kids in church for a babysitting service, it's not very effective long term. We have a lot of people that where we get the wife to come and bring the kids to church and it has like a 30% effectiveness. But when the father, when the man of the house is the one that takes the initiative to bring people to the kingdom work that done at the church, it has a tremendous success factor. We men today on Father's Day have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to father kids we don't know. We have a responsibility to be mentors. We have a responsibility to be for us what those coaches were. What those other They didn't talk to us about God, but they talked to us about life. They talked to us about not giving up, not being afraid of the odds. <laughs> Sam Rayburn actually beat Pasadena High School in 1969. The odds were against us. But we won. And it was in large part, it was all you know, those players on the field, Wade Rockmore and others did a great job. But there was a coach somewhere in the background telling them they could. And if nothing else today, maybe I get to be the coach, tell you, friends, you can help Jesus Christ change the world. Well, you can. Now the question is, will you? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to get my hymn and get down here.
You know, there's a whole bunch of hymns in this book. And we should probably sing all of them. We don't always. But there's not a better one for closing out a service than this one. If today would be the day you unite with our church, come forward as we sing. Let's stand and sing, Blessed be the time that binds us. Blessed be the time that binds our hearts in Christian love. The We don't pass an offering plate yet after COVID, but we do have a basket in the back. We gladly accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings there. I hope and pray for safe travels for anybody that's traveling. I hope every father and every person here gets the joy of being celebrated on Father's Day. And those of us whose dads have gone on to be with God, uh, there's no way to be closer to them than through prayer today in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So it is the love of God the teachings of Jesus Christ, and friends, the power of the Holy Spirit that will get us through. Go in peace.
Oh, thank you, Ann. Thank you, dear. See you soon. I'm leaving town right after this, and I won't be back ever. Ever. Never. Well, until Saturday. <laughs> we're going to Somerville. My my son was here, and my grandson. We're going up there for a few days. Oh, that'd be nice. Try to get my boat fixed and go. Maybe go to the lake. Well, that'd be fun. Yeah, it'll be good. Father, son, grandson time. Yeah, and then I'm going to go have lunch with my other son before we leave town. So. Oh, well, that'd be good. Yeah, it's always good to see him, even though I I talk to him pretty often, but yeah. You have a good day too. Go go out and sit in the pool. Probably will. I've been sick. 